Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, January 9th, 2014 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Uh, I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and I will begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll of the School Committee. Ms. Lindeboff? Present. Present. Here. Mr. Andrew Present. And Present. Present. <laughs> Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, just trying to keep you in suspense there. Um, so first begin by welcoming our new members to the school committee who were all uh, sworn into office and welcome them uh, to us. And um, we have some organizational issues. Because this is the first meeting of the new term of the school committee, um, we have some organizational issues that under, uh, our, under the charter uh, we are required to take care of. Um, the first is the election of a vice chair. Um, so uh, what I will ask is for a motion to open the floor for nominations uh, for a vice chair. Move to open the floor for nominations for a vice chair. Is there a second? Sorry. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. And so I would um, entertain any nominations to serve as vice chair of the school committee. Ms. Duvall. I would like to nominate Ed Zukowski. Okay. Is there a second of Mr. Zuchowski's second. nomination? Second. Okay. That's been seconded. Okay. Is there any other um, nominations uh, for the position of vice chair? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to uh, close the nominations. Move to close the nominations. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so the nominations are closed. Um, and we have one uh, candidate uh, for vice chair, uh, Mr. Ed Zahowski. Um, I would. I, I would ask if you'd want to make a candidate speech, but it seems like uh, <laughs> I will simply accept the nomination. Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, then I would ask all those in favor of electing uh, Mr. Zahowski as vice chair, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the ayes have it, and uh, congratulations, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you to my fellow committee members. I will do my best to execute my duty as your vice chair. Thank you. Um, the next um, item on the agenda is the election of <coughs> an executive secretary. Um, and under our rules, uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, it's the superintendent. It yes. <laughs> uh, so under our rules, actually, the superintendent <coughs> serves as our executive secretary uh, for signing off on, um, on some of the orders that the, that the uh, school committee takes care of. So I would ask for a, um, I guess I would ask for a, a nomination of, sure, why don't we do that? Move to appoint the superintendent as our executive secretary. For Second. The Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Um, any debate or discussion about that? Uh, I was hopeful. You don't get to debate, actually, <laughs> Madam Superintendent. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> any abstentions? Okay, so we have our vice chair and we have our executive secretary. Um, we also need to set our annual meeting schedule, and I believe you have in your packets the um, proposed uh, 2014 um, meeting schedule, uh, which uh, is outlined. Um, you will note that um, the, uh, the schedule has been shifted. Um, in past years, there were uh, more meetings in the April, May, June time frame, but now because of the more front-loaded budget process, uh, those meetings have been moved up into the February uh, March uh, meeting because the body has to take a vote by its April 10th meeting on the FY15 budget. So um, are there any questions or concerns about the meeting schedule? Hearing none, I would accept a motion to accept the meeting schedule. Move to accept the meeting schedule as stands. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so we have adopted the meeting schedule for 2014. The final, um, the final organizational item 
is the adoption of your rules and procedures. Um, and I would note that these are uh, rules and procedures that there would have been some quite a bit of work and discussion that went into them uh, during the last year because they had to be amended and revised to comply with the new charter that passed um, in November of 2012. And so these these reflect many <coughs> changes to update um, to update the charter for that. Um, I will accept. Okay, so there's a motion to accept the minutes or approve approve the rules rather. Um, is there a second? Second. Okay. Are there any questions or discussion or comment about our rules of procedure? Okay. All those in favor of adopting uh, the rules and procedure for the 2014-2015 session, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, one other uh, issue is uh, just the um, appointment of uh, committees, and I know that uh, that's something that is the uh, chair's responsibility, though I'll be working closely with the vice chair, who will be contacting you um, or uh, for the uh, your requested committee assignments and I my hope is to go ahead and make those appointments as soon as possible when we have that those collected so I believe an email went out to everybody did everybody receive the email yes. mm -hmm. okay we have hard copies if you need one um, and I think the request is that information would be sent back by tomorrow so if you could get that back in a timely manner mayor and I will sit down and work on making those appointments I think by charter we have 10 days or like that. Yeah. So you should be hearing next week. Okay. Okay. So that uh, completes the um, organizational um, items for the meeting, and we'll now move into the public comment portion. Uh, and under the rules <laughs> we just adopted, um, we allow members of the public up to three minutes uh, per person to speak. And I have a list, and I have my timer. And, um, and I would ask uh, you to state your name and address for the record. And the first person that signed up is Cindy Mahoney. Hello, happy new year. Hi, I'm Cindy Mahoney. I live at 77 Emerson Way. Um, I do feel like, as I said to Mr. Lombardi, it's sort of like the movie Groundhog Day. But um, with regard to the late start issue, um, I'd like to start out, though, first by thanking the team at Leeds who works with my first grader. The saying goes, it takes a village to raise a child, and I'm very grateful that part of our village includes the folks at Leeds School. I also wish to thank the high school teachers and staff who challenge and inspire my older girls. I want those educators and coaches to know that the kids are listening, even if they're also wondering how their hair looks. <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to thank Tracy Harity for her courage. You can hear the care and concern for students in her voice when she makes those snow day phone calls but you can also hear the compassion for parents faced with the prospect of an unexpected, unexpected extended winter vacation. Before my older daughters entered the high school, I thought a later start might be a good idea. Now that they are both at the high school, we are very aware of the negative impact of a later dismissal. I initially got involved in these Thursday school committee meetings last year, not because there wasn't anything good on TV, but because I didn't want my seven-year-old being dismissed from elementary school at 3.30, as one of the earlier proposals outlined. One of the reasons I've stayed involved is because I continue to be concerned that a vocal minority is pressing for a change that is not needed or wanted by the majority of staff and students and families at Northampton High. The three plans mentioned in today's Gazette seem to burden all city schools. In the flip scenario for JFK and NHS, what is to be gained by having 12, 13, and 14 year olds going to school at 7.30? If NHS starts at 8.45 as another plan mentioned and is dismissed at 315, that will phenomenally impact after school jobs, babysitting, clubs, dance, volunteering, extra help, and athletics. Any one of the building principals and the director of special education could provide a long list of improvements to salaries and safety they would be thrilled to use in place of additional money spent on busing. Our district is designated level three, so our energy and resources should be put towards remediating that. It is absolutely, uh, pardon me, I applaud the idea of Super Superintendent Nash to use an outside consultant while I bemoan the necessity of using school funds for this purpose. There seems to have been some miscommunication on the part of the previous committee with regard to the impact this change on Smith classes and athletics would have. 
It is my hope that an impartial group would be better able to see how a shift in schedule would impact students, teachers, and families at all grade levels. Lastly, it's absolutely true that students need to be well rested. They should also be well nourished and get plenty of exercise. And we should use our existing resources to see that that happens, including wellness classes, the Northampton Prevention Coalition, and advisory time to help our students manage their health and well-being. Students must also begin to take responsibility for their actions. It is incumbent upon us as parents and educators to guide them towards doing so. Thank you. Okay, well timed. Uh, uh, the next speaker is uh, Jeffrey Buber. I'm Jeff, Jeffrey Buber, 35 Food Street. I would like to point out, I think, given the paper, that the proposal that the middle school starts at 7.30, the high school at 8.00, I think the rec department could work around this and restore the hour-long water aerobics in the morning with least impact in the evening. As far as busing costs, we've got a lot of new tax base coming on up King Street, and I think, Mayor, is it what about a little over a million dollars proposal increase will come in. Yeah. I'm not really allowed to interact with uh, the public comment. Um, Whatever it is, you should be able to tap in it if there's any more extra costs in busing. You've got plenty of revenue. Let's use it. Thank you. Uh, the next. Uh, Speaker is Laura Frogamini. Oh, there's Laura. Thank you. Um, I, too, am here to speak about the um, article in the paper today that um, surprised and unnerved me. As um, an educator and a parent and a community member, um, I just Quick, five quick things. So one, um, as, a, as I'm also an administrator at a school, I don't think administrative difficulties or challenges should ever trump what is educationally sound and developmentally appropriate for children. It is the science is there. Children developmentally at that age learn better a little later. And maybe that would have an impact on level three schools if the teachers weren't trying to teach children who are best meant to sleep a little bit later in the mornings. If they come to school ready, we might actually impact a difference that way. Um, the two, the community has shown sustained support and desire for the later start time. And I frankly believe that the override passed to show that community support. I know I felt really en enlivened and um, joyful that the school committee was paying attention to the science behind what is developmentally appropriate and when it's developmentally appropriate for them to learn. Um, so to see that in the paper today that, well, now that you gave us the money, we're not going to um, now teach and, and focus on this, it felt um, upsetting. So I would, um, I hope those two things aren't quite as tied as the newspaper made them seem. Um, this committee voted it to happen. Please do not renege on that promise. And um, I'd like us, if we're talking about school start times, to frankly talk about what that means for the students who are bused. Mm -hmm. So my friend's daughter, as you know, my kids have to be out the door and they're, you know, by 7, 5, 7, 10 in order to put their things away and be ready for class. My friend's daughter has to get the bus at 6.30 in the morning. So back that up again. Let's talk about when the first child has to get the first bus route. 6.30 or is it even earlier? That's the earliest one I know. And um, that's what I'd like us to focus on is that hour as opposed to um, when that bus route starts as opposed to when the school bell rings. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Okay, so those are the folks that were signed up for public comment. Um, are there others who wish to speak for public comment? Steve Harrell. <coughs> I thought you had retired, Steve. Just 
Hello, my name is Steve Harrell, and I live at 474 Elm Street. I was not intending to speak tonight. However, I felt compelled to respond to some of the earlier comments we heard. Uh, one comment was that there appears to be a vocal minority who favor a later start time and are kind of driving it. But I would like to remind everyone that the vote of this body last June 13 was seven to two, seven in favor of a later start time. I don't think that's a minority. Also in 2009 at Northampton High School, a survey was conducted under the auspices of the administration. <clears throat> and at that time, about two thirds of the students themselves favored a later start time. Again, I don't think that's a minority. We also heard that after school jobs would be greatly affected and that almost, and that there would be an impact on the Smith classes, Northampton High students taking the Smith classes. I served on the ad hoc committee appointed by the mayor and the superintendent at that time. And uh, we met every week for about four months. And one of the things we looked at was after school jobs. We interviewed 14 typical employers in the town, uh, including the Stop and Shop, McDonald's, and so forth. And we found that there was virtually no resistance to a later start time at the high school. The employers, uh, almost all of them, said that they would be glad to adjust their work schedules uh, if it were beneficial to the students. Uh, that report of the ad hoc committee also gave detailed uh, explanations about the Smith classes, when they start, when they end, how they uh, don't coordinate very well with our current uh, high school uh, periods, and how there would be uh, very little uh, effect uh, if the new uh, start time were instituted at the high school. Uh, the current situation is really deplorable. Students have to leave class early, they get to the class late. Some Smith professors don't allow that, some do. Uh, some of the high school teachers allow the students to leave early or come late, so it's certainly not very good as it is. Uh, finally, I'd just like to say that, um, ooh, 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> there is a plan B that we've sort of been kicking around, and I just want to make sure everyone understands that. It's a plan for the high school to start at 8 or 8.15 that does not affect any of the bus uh, routes, the costs, or any of the other um, high, uh, school start or end times. It's simply that the students who arrive now at the school at about 7.05 will have to wait that extra time period before school starts at 8 or 8.15. Now they wait till 7.30. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrell. Okay, so I, that will conclude our public uh, comment session for this evening. Um, we'll now move into the um, consent agenda portion of the evening. Um, uh, and so the first item on the consent agenda is a series of uh, minutes. Uh, we, well, actually, we have one set of minutes, the school committee meeting of December 12th, uh, 2013. Um, in terms of contract approvals, we have no contract approvals for this evening. Um, we do have some field trip requests. We have the NHS Ski Club going to Stratton Mountain, Vermont on January 26th. The NHS Academic Team going to Storrs, Connecticut in February 22nd, 2014. And then Bridge Street uh, Nature's Classroom April 1st through the 4th of 2014. Um, so I would ask for a, a motion to approve uh, the consent agenda. Move to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Seconded. Um, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, so the consent agenda items are approved. Um, we'll now move into reports and recommendations and we will have a report uh, from our student representatives, um, Emily Stam and Maddie Kahalane. Hi. Um, at Northampton High School, we're about to finish the first semester of this year. Our last full day of school is the 21st of January, and then we have finals on the 22nd and 23rd. And our second semester will start on the 27th. So this year, uh, 
the grant for AP tests ended. So there are no more Saturday sessions uh, outside of school hours for kids in AP classes to get extra help or review if their AP class was the previous semester. Um, and a lot of people think this is going to negatively affect our test results. Um, some departments have applied for other grants, but I have not heard of any coming through with positive results. Yeah, and, th and this was very helpful, especially it was in the math, science, and English departments that had these Saturday sessions, and a lot of people came and really benefited. And uh, that was reflected. Was, oh, yeah. And that was reflected <laughs> in the scores our school got. It was also in tandem with a couple other area schools, so um, there was a collaborative element to it, learning with other students we hadn't worked with before. Um, the grant also tapped into, um, it helped pay for the tests, because each test is getting increasingly more expensive to take, um, and many students can't uh, or would rather not pay that much money. And then there's also the, th like to report on the theater program at NHS. So we have the One Act Festival coming up and that will be on January 16th, 17th, and 18th at 7 p.m. And at this festival, kids can perform in small groups, um, all kinds of different short plays. And it started about six years ago and has, got, and has had a bigger turnout every year. So we expect a good turnout this year. And uh, that also helps to raise money for the theater department, as does the musical. Uh, rehearsals for both actors and Pitt have started recently. Um, and the band as a whole, not just the Pitt, will be going on a trip to um, Carnegie Hall to play and uh, experience other culture in the city for a few days uh, in a few months. And then in robotics, um, Ms. Johnson's robotics team recently got their assignment. So they have to build a robot that can play a game called Aerial Assist, where robots in teams of three have to score balls into goals and get points for that and for collaborating with other robots. So that's cool. Um, oh, uh, sports, a lot of winter sports have been having their first meets and competitions um, in this week. Uh, among those are fencing and um, skiing. Uh, basketball has been placing well uh, in the state on both sides. Um, I believe that's all. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much for the report. Okay, um, the next item on the agenda. Um, I'm seeing is, is Joe Bartolomeo here? Okay. Uh, I was, we have the next item is for the NEF SOS book fund gift. Um, so we may want to put that off a little while in case he's running late. Um, that's a presentation of a gift. So um, with the committee's indulgence, we'll move ahead in the agenda. Um, and we'll go to a report um, from the superintendent on the high school late start proposal, um, which is related to a requested vote which was continued by you at your last meeting um, to this meeting and that was on a contract uh, with uh, Tyler Technologies or Versatrans. So I'll turn it over to the superintendent. <coughs> um, first of all I want to thank people who attended this evening on the late start issue and for those of you who also spoke. Um, I want to assure everyone that as an educator, I am aware of the study of adolescence and sleep requirements. And like everyone else on the administrative team, we support that study. We understand it. And we would love to have that happen for the adolescents in Northampton. That is not the issue. Um, I also want to assure people that we carried out the directive of the school committee, which met on June 13th. And the directive to the superintendent was to implement a later start time at Northampton with the start time would be to be between 8 and 8.30 and to take effect no later than September of 2014. We did that. I worked with an administrative team consisting of three principals, high school principal, middle school principal, and one elementary principal representing all the elementary principals. In addition, I worked with the director of transportation and the business manager. We came up with a plan. Um, the plan we came up with is not one that we support, but it's the only one that we were able to come up with. And there are two problems with it. Uh, first of all, it changed the start times for all three of the level, um, 
grades, meaning elementary, middle school, and high school. And the reason uh, that happened is because after the June 13th meeting in which we were directed to do this, we also had an override vote which put high school transportation back into the mix. Without the high school transportation on June 13th, it would not have been an issue. The high school would simply have changed their bell schedule. It would have nothing to do with the elementary or middle school. There was no busing. Once you put the busing back in, and because we're on a three-tiered busing system, it had an impact. So the plan that we came up with in order to implement it in September was basically the middle school and the high school would be exchanging early start times. And we really are concerned about that as administrators um, because we also recognize that adolescents are also seventh and eighth graders. We also are concerned about that age group being out uh, waiting for buses in the winter and we had several other concerns. The second part of that is the fact that it would cost us an additional $48,000 for busing because right now the number of buses that we start with is five for the high school. We'd be starting with nine um, because we'd be starting with the middle school. We'd have wait time and it would increase our busing costs by $48,000. I did not feel that I'm in a position to go ahead and do that with explicit um, direction from the school committee because it's an additional cost of $48,000. Um, that I don't know that we have, and I don't know if that's the best use of it. That's not my decision. The second thing we looked <coughs> at that people brought to our attention <coughs> was the idea of um, let's not do anything with the middle school and the elementary school. We'll leave their times exactly alone, and we will hire five more buses to take care of the high school students. Strictly high school. Coming and going, it'll just be high school. Uh, and when we looked at that, the cost of five buses for the number of 180 school days for the year, um, along with one additional van that we probably would need for those students who live in remote areas, um, we're looking at over $300,000. That would obviously be the easiest fix. It's the most expensive, and I'm not sure that people really want to go there either. So. Since I've been here, and I know some of you even longer have heard about a plan called hub busing. And basically, hub busing would work this way, according to um, Mr. Howard Moore, who's not here tonight, but he brought it to our attention and sat with um, our director of transportation, our business manager, and outlined the plan in detail. Hub busing would be this. High school students and elementary students would be transported together as far as the busing. The way it would work is in the morning, the hub would be the elementary schools. So everyone who lived further than two miles, is it two or one and a half miles? One and a half. One and a half miles away from the elementary school would be picked up and transported to the elementary school. The elementary kids would get off the bus, and the high school kids would then be transported to the high school. That would be the morning. The afternoon would be different, not the same hubs. At that point, the high school students are transported, the high school students and the, to the middle school. are transported to the middle school. The middle school now becomes the hub. And then they're transported with the middle school students home. So we have two different sets in terms of hubs. And it would mean that some kids who live within the mile and a half in the morning may not live within the mile and a half in the afternoon. So you can see this gets a little complex. So what's involved in that is not the trans trans versa trans system that we have currently is set up for the program that we have the way we transport now. If we're looking at doing this, this is a totally different <coughs> program. We do not have the expertise in our office, nor do we have the time. And frankly, I'm not sure if we did it in our office that it, whatever the results are, would not be suspect. So we put forth, we called Trans, uh, Versatran. We have a proposal from the consultant. Uh, we'll work with the parameters that Mr. Moore gave us and try to come up uh, with a schedule that will work um, for late start at the high school. That's where we're at. 
I've heard various things in the last few days about what I said or what I didn't say. And I want to make it clear that I support what it is you're trying to do. I'm just not sure, and I don't have a dog in this fight, I'm not sure whether the school committee, if there's additional costs, wants to support it or not. So in order to find out whether hub busing would work, because Mr. Moore thinks that it will not be, uh, it would be cost neutral um, and it might save us money in the long run, future years, or it may not. I don't know. I won't know until we have the results of the study and that's why I'm asking the school board to support that. Now I hear um, a lot of people talking about plan B and here's the problem with plan B. The idea is that busing would remain the same. Those kids who ride the bus from the high school would continue riding the bus at the same time. They'd be dropped off at the high school at 7.05 or 7.10. They would stay there until school starts at 8 or 8.15 and then they would stay through until the bus comes back after the elementary run to pick them up at four o'clock. So we have 257 kids, not 100, who ride the bus. That's a quarter of the population of the high school who are now in school for nine hours. And the last time I thought about this, whether your kid rides the bus or walks, they're still an adolescent and they're entitled to as much sleep as every other child. So I understand that there are a lot of people who are passionate about this, and I think that's terrific. So am I. I'm here, and the administrative team is here, to look out for all the children, not just some of the children. So in order to try to put this to bed, which I that's my goal, that's what I want to do this year, because I'm the fourth superintendent to deal with this. The administrators who have been here right along have been dealing with it a lot longer than I have. I've already spent too much time on it. And I know they have. We have a lot of needs in this district. We are a level three district. The last time I checked, we don't have all the staffing we should have for all of the students not just AP, not just average students, not just special needs students. We don't have funding for staffing we need in our schools. Our elementary schools do not have media center specialists. I don't know if you realize that. What a waste. We have libraries. We don't have all the technology we, have, we need. We don't have kids being taught by technology people in terms of research skills, et cetera. There are a lot of needs, and I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. So the only thing I'm going to assure you of that I think we're all on the same page. We're all trying to do what's best for kids. We'd like to have everyone who's an adolescent be able to start school later. There's no disagreement on that. The issue before Northampton is once you find out if there's a cost for doing that, is that your priority? Do you want to do that? And if you tell me you do, then I'm happy to do it because it's your community and your decision. But I would say this, <clears throat> if this were an easy decision, if this did not depend on financial needs as well as others, then every school district in the nation would be doing it. There are very few school districts doing it. And I contend the issue is one of finance. So I think we need to find out. I hope the school committee this evening will vote for um, the proposal that I put forth in terms of the hub busing to see what that looks like and see if it will work. If it's cost neutral, then I suspect we'll go ahead and do it for September. If there's a cost to it, then I think the school committee needs to examine what that cost is and whether or not they want to invest their money that way. And that will be their decision, not mine, theirs. I'd be happy to answer any questions, um, but that's basically what we're doing. Okay. Ms. Duvall. I do have a question. Um, I just, just a question of clarification, please. The hub busing, in the morning they all go to the elementary hub, in the afternoon the high school students go to the middle school hub, mm -hmm. and we have a, a mile and a half criteria. So you said that, there, that the criteria is going to be different for these same students in the morning and the afternoon Could because be. of it being. So it's not 
to the actual high school or I mean it's from the distance from in the morning it would be the <coughs> mile and a half from the elementary schools but in the afternoon it's the mile and a half from the middle school so you could have someone living close to one of the elementary schools who walks to the elementary school mm -hmm. but in the afternoon has to be bused from the middle school because they're too far away I understand what you're saying and maybe I'm like really thick here but why isn't it an hour, a mile and a half from the high school which is their ultimate destination and where we ultimately get them anyway because they have to walk and yeah. Mark uh, they have to walk to that in order to make the hub busing work they have to walk to that location where the bus is going to pick them up so in the planning of the routes you need to show and have them report to that hub to make that hub busing work so they have to be at that location um, if you do it at the high school uh, it, it, it just doesn't it won't work because was so it a mile and a half from the high school first of all I mean so we're not like picking up people that are a mile within the high school because it's further well to elementary school all the go. students would change because of the hub busing nobody would be using the high school as the hub you'd be using the elementaries in in that proposal right Okay, so the, the high school is out of the picture in measuring any type of mileage distances. So then somebody could live next door to the high school. I mean, I know it's a little bit far-fetched. And I mean, there has to be some sort of criteria in the first place, no? Um, that type of a situation is probably one of the unique ones, but we'd have to address that separately afterwards. But uh, uh, in, the, in the larger scheme of the hub busing, in order for the buses to go to those various locations, those st students need to, if they're within the mile and a half, walk to that location. If they're closer to the high school, well, then it would be their prerogative where they could go to. Okay. And obviously, we're only talking about bus students. Correct. So if you're living next door, you don't, you're not on the bus anyway. Right. right. So then originally, the criteria would be from the high school, like for now, and then, then it would be into a secondary tier as far as... Right. Okay. If, if you're so, not... Okay, I get it now then. Okay. That I, for, I didn't understand. If, I mean, you could live next door to the high school and have to go. No. Um, I have more that I want to say, but sure. that's all I had for clarification. So if other people have clarification. I, I just wanted a quick clarification just to follow on. Um, uh, so um, for, a, for a high school student, there, and they, if a high school student lives more than a mile and a half from the elementary school hub, are they going to get bussed to the hub no. or do they have to get to the hub mm -hmm. they have to get to the hub okay so they would be they would have to purchase a bus pass to get to there if they so desired so they get bussed to the hub though correct okay so they, they could or their parents could bring them or they could walk if they're within the mile and a half but if but if you got Okay, but why would you why would you drive your kid to the hub if you were paying for a bus pass? I guess is what I'm trying. You wouldn't to you just pick just but decide? Lived, one. But if you lived less than a mile and a half from a hub, you you'd have walk. to drive, or you, your you'd kid walk. would have to get to the to the hub uh, in order to get the bus to the school. I'm just thinking yes. of combinations yes, right. of where you could be. Um, the high school could be almost closer than the hub. That is true. But you still live a pretty far distance from the high school for a walk and so that's okay. that's some of those anomalies within the programming and making sure because now you've totally uh, diversified the students and now they're fractioned off into many different areas and instead of having the one hub for the high school you now have the the other hubs the other schools acting as hubs so we have multiple hubs so it's just a, a, a complicated issue to move those ch those children around okay the, can I just follow up the clarification sure then mr. shuffle had a question Never mind. let him do it I'll, I'll ask after um, my question has to do with the the timeline for the final decision that says yes we're going to do this you know, let's say we change the start time you know the later that goes on what is the impact that it will have on scheduling students for classes in the fall well I certainly would hope that we'd be able to take action at the March meeting mm -hmm. um, the consultant has assured us that he can have a report between 30 and 60 days so if you took the action tonight I would expect that 
It would be before the board at the March meeting. And that would be plenty of time to... I'm not sure. I think it's March. I don't know the exact time. Brian, can you help me with that? For when your students at the high school choose courses for next year. So if the board were to make a decision at the March <coughs> meeting, um, then that would be time in terms of the scheduling that you do at the high school, because I think the question revolves really around our agreement with Smith College. Yeah, a lot of our students is how Smith works. They do you want to come up to the podium? Uh, that would just, just so that <coughs> folks can hear you at home. Yeah, a lot of um, students typically build their schedule academically based on high school classes. And then when, they, when they're thinking about Smith classes, they don't really know until the Smith season um, begins. And what happens, our students who want Smith classes, they then go to Smith College, they interact with that teacher, and they find out from Smith College, are there room in those classes? They get the forms, and it navigates that way. So our students aren't signing up for Smith, Smith classes in March. Oh, okay. There's, not, there's none of that. So it really is, they build their academic schedule based on what we offer. They might build in, um, and they should be building it based on a, um, what they really need in case they don't get Smith. They shouldn't be building a light class. Um, and part of our dilemma is that we'll get students taking high-powered classes, they go to Smith College and they pull out and then we have a, a lot of numbers change. But there is no selection for Smith College that begins until the fall when Smith is in place. And then they go, they go to Smith College, they go to that professor, the professor looks in their classroom, is there room? And then it goes to the director or the dean of academics. They approve it, and then it gets back to us. So I don't really see this situation having any impact on um, students that are, have an interest of um, Smith College. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Did it, did that answer your question? Yes. OK. Mr. I just have a question on the, the numbers of students riding the buses. Uh -huh. Because I know that there are more than 250 passes that have been issued. But, um, you did say that the drivers took attendance, and I was wondering, what is the number of students per day that are disembarking from buses in the morning? It's 257 students at the high school who ride the bus. It's approximately, hold on. There's approximately another 100 who are Smith Vogue students, okay? And all of those students either have a pass because their parents have paid for it, or they have a pass because they're free and reduced lunch students. On the average, um, about how many students ride a bus? I'm, I'm asking uh, Joy Winnie if she could tell me that on a daily basis. Do you remember that? I don't. Mark, Mark. Mark, do you? I, I don't. It is. I don't it have is to less. To drivers. It is less, and. Um, I guess the point is, and I think some people have made this, is do we look to build a schedule based on those people who, because they have a pass, are expecting a seat on the bus, or do we build it based on the average of those who ride it? First of all, each semester it's a different number who ride it, depending upon sports, depending on the season of the year. Um, we don't have the same number who ride in the fall, who ride in the winter, who ride in the spring. So that's one consideration. And you can buy bus passes three times a year. Um, secondly, I guess I look at it sort of like airplanes. You know when you get bumped off an airplane? Well, let's assume that during this winter weather, we built our schedule around how many kids we could seat on the bus based on the average daily riding. Our buses are under regulations. The regulations basically say if you're elementary age, you can put three to a seat. If you're secondary age, you can only put two to a seat. This also plays into the fact we'd have high school students with elementary students. So with those considerations, the idea is, as far as I'm concerned, is everyone that has a bus pass, whether they paid for it or it's theirs for free and reduced purposes, they're entitled to ride the bus. I would not want to, on a cold day like we've had, when everyone wants to ride the bus, 
come to a bus stop, have six kids there and can only pick up four. I wouldn't want to be the parent, I wouldn't be, want to be the child, and I wouldn't want to be the superintendent waiting for the lawsuit. So my theory is, and what I've instructed um, Mark and uh, the consultant to work with, is the fact that we have bus passes out there and every child is entitled to a seat on the bus. Do they always take them? No. In good weather, they ride bicycles, they walk, sometimes they have other commitments, parents pick them up, whatever. But they do have a bus pass and I believe that they're entitled to a seat on the bus when they need it and want it. So we don't, so. We don't have the information though. I mean, yes, I, I have I, it. I I'm happy to give it to you tomorrow. I understand your point, but it seems to me that we're talking about allocating scarce resources and I just can't follow the argument that if there are 110 students riding the bus with a standard deviation of 12, mm -hmm. the probability that there will be 259 students is approaching zero. Mm -hmm. The probability that there would be 136 students is, is you know, 3%. So I guess I'm just trying, and, we, and again, since we've been going through this for five plus years, I'm just, we as a school committee need the data. Well, I'm happy. I'll send it out to all of you tomorrow. We, I did it with the group of people um, who have been prominently involved in this. They have those figures. I have them in the office. I'll send it to all the school committee members tomorrow. Is it 257 that write it every day? It is absolutely not. But also, if we're looking at the hub busing, you also have to remember that we're no longer going with the route that you put three kids to a seat. It depends on the number of high school students who are on the bus with the elementary well, students. I'm not, I'm, That's I'm, another I'm consideration. I'm not even getting to the hub system. Okay. All right. The sure. Other question I'm happy to send that out. Yeah. The, the hub system, the elementary, I haven't seen laid out in any of the documents exactly how the elementary start time would change. Because if the students are riding on the same bus, then you're delivering the high school students and the elementary school students at the same time. No. Yes, to the elementary school. To the elementary school, which means that the elementary school, then you need to leave time for the second feeder bus or, or pickup mm -hmm. bus. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, if you could just tell me briefly, what would the start time for the elementary schools? Well, I'm taking it um, from the newspaper, and this is uh, Howard's plan. He has it in here. Um, he said, can you help me with that, Mark? What was Howard's plan is to start times for these? Right here. Um, he said that the elementary schools would be starting before 8 a.m., mm -hmm. JFK somewhere around 8.15, and the high school at 8.45. Okay. No. Just um, to follow up on um, Mr. Meyer's question. Um, 257 bus riders at the high school. Uh, uh, does that really mean 257 passes at the high school? I mean, is yes. that what you're? That's yes. what you're counting. It's not necessarily bus riders. We're counting however many people get passes. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. So, so I guess the, uh, I mean the the question before the committee, which is what the question was on December. Uh, in December was this issue of the superintendent requesting uh, the authority to um, contract with Tyler to, to, to do an analysis of the hub busing system um, and, and, that, and to basically approve that contract. Um, I guess I was wondering if I could ask a question and that is the, um, when we voted on the report, the report that was presented from the last committee, what, uh, um, the, the committee that presented its report last May, um, it seemed to present, uh, and I think this is partly what folks, uh, uh, which probably gave it the support that it received, that there was really going to be minimal changes to, um, you know, to there were some little tweaks that were that would have to be done on passing times, and there were some small modifications. But it was really not going to be a major. It wasn't going to involve changing any of the other start times. Am I remembering that correctly? I mean, is that am I? That I mean. I don't. Are there people that were on? I don't remember it like that. Yeah. Okay. I don't remember it like that at all. Okay. Um, I have the minutes here from um, 
Are you done? I'm sorry. Well, no, I guess my question was we then gave that to the administrative team, and then it seems like it's gotten very, that we've now discovered that there are issues with um, some of the things that on paper seemed like they were easily overcome, able to overcome, but now um, we've discovered that it's not that easy. So, David, I think that has to do with the, with the fact that when we voted on it, mm -hmm. there was no busing to the exactly. high school. Yeah. So, so your recollection about that there wouldn't be changes to the elementary schools and the middle school, I was think, is accurate. based on the elimination of high school busing. Right. So there was no third tier to be able right. to mess right. to have to worry about. You could set whatever start time you wanted because kids had to get there whatever time you started. That's right. And that's really what moved things forward at that point. Necessarily. Okay. But I'm disagreeing with that that it moved things forward because, as I was starting to say, from the Thursday, the June 13th minutes, that night, um, Topics discussed, I'll just read quickly, topics discussed included how the change would be implemented, voting against the advice of the new principal as well as ALT, responsibility to constituents, loss of class time, budgetary and transportation issues, the thoroughness and content and content of the ad hoc's committee report, athletic team practices, difficulties implementing the current schedule, and when the changes in times would be instituted. Now, we then voted, but before we voted, I actually, Ms. Duval motioned to postpone the reconsideration vote until the July 11th meeting. And it was because at the time we had discussed that we don't know what the busing will be. We don't know all of those things. But they, my motion did not carry. It, um, Mr. Zukowski, Ms. Minnick, and myself were the only people that thought we should wait until the information came in. So when I, the point that I'm making now, and I didn't then vote for the proposal too, so I then became one of the people that also voted for it because I do believe in it. But the point that I'm making here is that we did consider all of those issues, and they were considered, and nobody wanted to reconsider until we had more information. They, it, it was definitely something that they said that this is something we believe in and we have to get it implemented. We want it implemented. It's an administrative problem now to how, as far as how it goes. So um, I just wanted to remind people of that because the issue of whether or not we had um, the proposition um, override, we knew that we hadn't discussed it. All of those issues were discussed on June 13th and I think that as a matter of integrity and respect to the process that forewarned is forearmed all of this was already discussed and, and, and put into that vote, the final vote that says that we should go through and have it um, have a school bus change for um, 2014. So um, okay. that's what I wanted but to But I think the other, but I guess, I guess the other piece of it was we believed at the time, we, we sent it to them, we believed it could be done revenue neutral or it could be done mm -hmm. because we weren't. Because they said that they hoped it would be done okay. new neutral or very small and that we needed to look at all of those okay. things. And, and I mean, because we, we took into consideration all of that. Okay. Failed. I, My proposal failed to uh, wait for all that information to come in. And I just think that since it did fail, that all of that was considered, mm -hmm. because it was considered, that we need to just respect and, and say, you know, this has been voted and decided on. We just need to do it. And with that said, I'd like to make a motion to um, approve the Versatrans um, solution to go through as recommended by the um, the contract as recommended by the superintendent. Okay. So that motion requires a second for discussion. A second for discussion. Okay. And then um, you had a question or a comment. Well, um, my obviously when we were discussing this in June, because high school busing at that point was not going to continue my assumption was that we were discussing it without major changes to the elementary and middle school time schedules um, and in many months of discussion prior to that there had been proposals that involved the change of middle school and high school uh, middle school high school and elementary school um, you know I, I remember making the argument when the earlier middle school time was proposed that 14 year olds shared a lot of the sleep schedule of the 14 year olds who were ninth graders and it doesn't make sense to say that you were biologically different because your birthday was mm -hmm. after September 1st. Um, I'm, I'm wondering why the plan B that that was mentioned has not been was not part of the superintendent's memo her presentation given that um, it would be revenue neutral 
Um, there would be no added tiers of busing. Um, we would be transporting some kids to school, but at the same time that they're being transported right now, um, so that from that perspective, um, we would be continuing an unfortunate practice for, for some of them. Obviously, we've been told that some of them are early birds and are not affected by it negatively. Um, and as far as the argument that we're forcing them to be in school, I think that a substantial number of students already, uh, their day doesn't end at 2.05 when the bell rings. They continue in other activities, um, some of them well into the evening. So I'm wondering from, from a perspective, trying to keep this simple, trying to affect a policy directive that the school committee voted on previously, um, I'm wondering why that would not be an option that we I'm, consider. Sure, I'm happy to speak to that. I guess it's pretty simple in my mind. It's obviously not simple for everyone else. But if we're going to implement a plan that's good for some kids, are we going to discriminate against those kids who have to take the bus to school and make them pay the price? Because they're the ones still getting up early. They're the ones still waiting to get on the bus. They get to school. They have an hour or an hour and 15 minutes in which they're going to be someplace in the high school waiting for classes to start. Then they're going to be in classes, and then we can't get back with the buses to make it revenue neutral until after the elementary run. So they're not going to be picked up until 4 o'clock. So now I've got just a quarter of the kids, those who are unfortunate enough, who don't live close enough to walk, who don't have parents to drive them or other relatives, who don't have their own cars, who have to take the bus because their parents work or they don't have cars, who are paying the price of being in the school for nine hours a day, not getting extra sleep in order for some kids to benefit from what all kids should be getting. And I don't think it's fair. I guess, I guess just to respond, since it was a response to my comment, the system's already discriminating against them. The system is already discriminating against them because they don't have a means of transportation outside of busing. Um, and I guess I'm not seeing the logic in saying that we could benefit. And again, I think that it's very important that we have the numbers here correct because if it's 257, that's a big difference between 103 or 120. And, and to say that 680 students or more, 700 students should not be allowed to benefit um, because we're, you know, we want to make sure that everyone is hurt the same doesn't seem to make sense to me. And we have an opportunity to provide the majority of the students with a benefit. I mean, you could say the same thing about the MIMSI grant. The MIMSI grant was only targeted at a select number of AP classes. It was targeted at the sciences. It was targeted at English. So for students taking APs in other areas, like foreign language, they didn't receive the benefit. We didn't turn down the MIMSI grant because it provided a benefit to a subset of our students. We don't turn down the opportunity to go to Smith College because only a certain subset of our students are able to do that. I mean, if we can benefit the majority, I'm not seeing why we wouldn't take that opportunity. And once we've benefited the majority, then we can move to closing the gap for the additional 100, 120 students. Can I ask about that? The other question I had was, is there a staffing, who would, who would be in charge of the children that would be at the school for an hour and 15 minutes? Where would they be during that? Brian, the, would you like to speak to that? the early arrive, who would be watching the early arrival? Mr. Lombard? I I, yeah, I've already thought of that. Um, with my back of the envelope cal calculations. Um, clearly already we have students at school who are not, no one is tasked to supervise them. Um, I, I received an, you know, I saw an email exchange, someone saying, well, teachers could do it. I can tell you, as a teacher, my time before the students get into my classroom is not the time when I want to be trying to supervise them or tasked with doing anything else than preparing for my day. But we already know that the students are dropped off at 7.05 and the start time is not until 7.30, so there's a 25 minute gap. Um, extending it by half an hour, I'm not going to assume that we can't supervise them. But let's assume we have 120 students and we need five staff members to supervise them in a, a zero hour study hall for half an hour. Well, that's five times a half hour. That's 2.5 times $20 an hour. Um, if you work out the math, it's about $9,000 a year. 
Now again, if you had all 250, it would be $18,000 a year. Now is that zero? No, it's not zero, but again, it's, we're, about to be, we're about to be asked to spend $10,500 to investigate something that we don't even know whether it's gonna lead, lead us in, in a positive direction or provide us with anything. So I think, you know, for me as a school, com school committee member, to spend $9,000 to do that supervision is not an unreasonable amount of money for the benefit. Okay, um, it, would, it, would be, it would cost money. Um, I'm not sure where, where it would fall in terms of contracts. Um, I'm sure Sharon that which category it's coming to. Is it ESP, is it a teacher? Who, who would want that? Um, it is true that at about 7.05 the students do start to arrive, and sort of the teachers, and the place becomes a little, uh, like a little beehive, begins to kind of take on a life of its own. Um, I don't know what it would look like bringing students in at seven and saying, you're expected to go there and wait um, and be supervised. I don't know what, you know, I'm not sure. We've never done that. We don't have study halls in the classroom. I'm not sure, would we mandate them? Would they be forced to do that? And if they didn't, what if they wanted to walk and go across the street? It seems it opens up a lot of holes of accountability. Typically at seven o'clock they come in and the energy and the force is gearing them toward either the sales in the morning, getting them toward the classes. Um, to me it's about access. And if we're gonna access and benefit for all. If we think that adolescents benefit from a late start, then we put in a system that all kids across the board in our city have access to it. If we don't, what we're saying is these privileged kids can, but the kids that take a bus, hey, I'm sorry, what we will do for you though, you can come to the high school, we'll put you in the cafeteria, and you can put your head down there. Seems a little harsh to me. Okay, back to Chuck, and then. Um, <clears throat> I think figuring how much it's going to cost for supervision for a half hour is not looking at the numbers that Dr. Nash is presenting. I think what we're talking about is an hour before school total. If they're there half an hour now, we're gonna be adding another half hour. And then after school is an additional time period when the kids are going to be um, unsupervised. Um, I understand the argument that sometimes you have to benefit the majority, um, but I think 100 or over 100 kids not getting the opportunity to benefit from the late start is a lot. Um, I, I simply don't think it's fair to just say to them, you know what, you have to take a bus. Sorry, that's just the way it's going to be. And your day's going to start at 6.30, and by the time you get home, it might be 4 or 4.30. So you won't be able to possibly have a job. You know, all those things come into play. So, in my opinion, it's worth investigating if it's possible for the hub system to work. It is money, I understand that, but I think it's an investment into a solution. Okay, um, no, I, I just, again, the idea that um, it's not acceptable to allow the students to go to a study hall or basically to be in a room. And I, I would think that as far as the issue of whether they're going to walk across the street, um, our, our handbooks all say that if you don't comply with the rules on the bus, that you can lose the privilege to take the bus to school. And I would think that, therefore, that would be part of the contract <coughs> of taking school transportation that you would report, just like a class, and you, the tenants would be taken. If you didn't show up, then you'd lose that privilege. And it seems strange to me to say that it's discriminating to force you to show up and be in a study hall, but what we'd rather do is force you to show up and actually take a class and be forced to perform in that class. Um, because you know, that's also discriminating against those kids, those 100 kids. They're competing with other students who are getting more sleep. Why? Because their parents can afford or have the opportunity to drive them. Um, and, I, and I think that it's also, I don't think that if, again, and we don't have the data, I don't think that if you looked at the ridership, um, I know from people who talk to me about this issue, it's not just the kids who are reduced in free lunch. We have a substantial ridership that purchased the passes, that it's a scheduling issue more than a resource you know, issue. So, um, 
I, I think I think the equity is an important consideration. I don't think it rules here. Mr. Shelfo, um, I just want to I want to think we're getting a little bit off the topic because really what we're talking about is are we going to do the Versa Trans contract or not? So. I did just want to share that that uh, I, I talked to the superintendent uh, early in the week, and I I contacted Versatrans just to, for my own satisfaction, just to understand what we were talking about. I just want to share some of the things that I discovered. Um, <clears throat> first of all, what really helped me understand a little bit better is that the contract we're talking about is not for ten thousand dollars. It is for up to ten thousand dollars. There is a sixty-hour um, block of time in there. Um, and I was talking to our sales rep, and he explained to me, I won't hold him to this, but I will say what he said. He said he does not believe that it will even come close to the 60-hour mark. You know, his feeling that it was is, is going to be significantly less than that. I asked him why he then budgeted for so much, and maybe he knows more about this board than uh, I gave him credit for. But he said, well, uh, if we just stick to one thing, uh, and someone used the phrase that if we work within the parameters that Mr. Moore set for us and we say this is the plan that you want us to investigate, then it's going to be, you know, significantly less than $10,000. If you start saying, oh, well, that's good. Well, let's try this, 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 and this, you know, that's where the cost is going to go up. So as I say, maybe he knows us better than, the, than we said. <coughs> um, the question that I had was, was why can't we do this ourselves? And what he explained to me is that typically, uh, transportation directors, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, they, they work with a, a, uh, a limited set of possibilities that exist within the system. And what we need to do is we need to take a look at this system and, and play through a lot of what-if scenarios, which is a little bit outside the comfort zone of the typical transportation director who does this. Um, I did explore the possibility with the superintendent of saying, is there anybody else in our school district who could possibly do this? Uh, and what she said to me was, no, we don't have anybody who's available to do this this right now. Um, I would say, just an observation that I would make to the superintendent and to the business manager, um, I think it's bad practice to buy software that doesn't come with proper training to go along with it so that we don't have to go back to them to say, hey, can you help me learn how to use this? But that's a, that's a side comment. Um, I think the important thing is that um, I am more comfortable knowing that it is not, should not be $10,000 uh, if we're able to stick with what we're talking about, which is investigating the hub system and its permutations for how to get it done. So I wanted to share that. So are you supportive of it, of, 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 the, of the investigation? Yes, I am. <coughs> Me. Oh, okay. Um, I, I just wanted to address the idea of fair for a second here. Um, if we're talking about fair, it's not really fair at all that people have to buy bus passes to go to school while just based on where you live, other people don't. I mean, that's not fair. And we used to have our school, our high school used to start at 8 o'clock, and I used to be one of the people um, that received the unfair. I was at my bus stop at 6.50, even when it started at 8. I was at school by 7.05, even though it started at 8. But there's a big difference between going to school and um, working, studying right away versus just kind of chilling for an hour. I mean, it's not the ideal, but it's, it was actually quite doable. So um, I wanted to say that. And that we used to have it at 8 o'clock. It used to be at 8 o'clock. The high school started at 8 o'clock. So I don't understand why we wouldn't be able to get back to that. And I would like So to we're debating the, the motion right now. Um, I, just, I just have a quick question. Sure. Which is because the superintendent, when she went through the times for the hub system, I believe she said 845 start for the high school. Around there. Which that's, is not. That's, that's my understanding of Mr. Um, Moore's proposal. So I'm wondering why we're investigating a scenario that doesn't actually comport with our previous vote, Sorry. unless we're unless we're planning to take a new because vote. Because this is Mr. Moore's proposal. and he thinks it's going to work and there are other people who think it's going to work so that's why we're looking at the hub system i didn't make up the times um this is this is what he came up with mark will you double check that that's what the newspaper said i never saw the actual numbers um joy you and um mark met with him is that what he said do you have that with you tonight the uh start times that i have on the notes that I have with me, he proposed in his hub system that the elementary would start at 750, the high school would start at 8, and JFK would start at 835. Okay. 
So those are the times that we, we gave to the consultant. The consultant has all of this information from Mr. Moore. They're just holding and doing nothing until they know the results of the board meeting tonight. So those are the times. How can we go outside the parameters? Mr. Zahowski. So again, I think we are talking about the Versatrans contract here. And um, I think a few things that we also have to consider are, one, this impacts elementary schools and middle schools as well. And so we're trying to solve a problem at the high school, no doubt. But um, the elementary school and the middle school, to my knowledge, has, have not come forward and asked for any change um, at their schools as far as start time. Um, we've had discussions around this before, and we've had parents come out and voice their concerns about it. And I think it was one of the reasons why this committee never really got passed and fully supported the HUD system to begin with because of the fact that elementary and middle school times would be changed, as well as there was an overwhelming support for first and second graders to be riding with 11th and 12th graders. I do believe from discussions we've had before that that was a concern of the committee. This Versatrans contract we're looking at goes with the idea that high school and elementary school children will ride together and also that the start times at the elementary school and the middle school will change. So we're going to pay up to 10000 hopefully a lot less, to investigate a plan that if is identified as being viable and doable, then if we spend the money, I think we should go through with the plan. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that the committee or our community really supports the ideas within the Versatrans contract, which include those things that I just mentioned. And I have a concern about that. Other questions? I do. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the end times for elementary school. I hear 750. So would elementary schools be done at two? Is that what? Did Howard speak to that? The, the dismissal times under the hub would be that the elementaries would dismiss at two. The high school would dismiss at 2.30, and the middle school would dismiss at 3.10. Sure. So as a new, as a new school committee member, um, what's confusing to me is I get that we're voting on this $10,000 um, study, but I agree with you that I, there are so many more issues. I, I'm getting emails, as you all have, around um, not wanting their kids to be at bus stops at 6.30. I can imagine that we'd get elementary school parents saying, wait a minute, this is my kid's at a bus stop. My six-year-old's at a bus stop at 6.30. Um, so I wonder if those conversations you guys have had, I, I just haven't been a part of it, but it is a concern of mine. Like, what, what are the ramifications of those dark times on elementary school students and middle school, but I'm thinking of elementary school. Yeah, and I think the because the hub plan wasn't part of the yeah. ad hoc report, it wasn't that w that wasn't the scenario that was presented to the school committee when we voted on it. Mm -hmm. um, that was not the we were looking at it just a three, well, a, a two tier system um, mm -hmm. with three different start times, yeah. and that's what we voted on. So yeah. this is a <coughs> dep twist on or departure on from that. Mm -hmm. So. Mr. Zahowski. I'd also like to be cautious of spending money that um, we do have, but we, we really don't have. We had to hire a full-time teacher already. Uh, this year, we've uh, changed the half-time position to full-time for our director of curriculum. We spent money there. Um, in my last several years on this committee, it's very common that around January, our superintendent comes out putting a, a freeze on expenditures to make sure that we can stay within our budget. And I would hate to think that we would be um, um, spending money that in the end wouldn't bear any fruit if we weren't to follow through with what the plan had um, to offer and to show us. So I'm not 100% convinced that the study will come out in a positive way, 
that would allow us to then say this is um, worth the money that we spent versus spending it on something else, which down the line we will most definitely discuss and have um, debate over on how to spend that type of money in the next few months um, for the next year's budget. Um, uh, Mr. Duvall and then Ms. Dykerchuk. Um, I understand what um, Mr. Zukowski is saying, but I also support the um, superintendent because I believe that this needs to be, we need to examine it and have, we are unable to do it as a school district. We've We've done as much as we can, according to the superintendent. We don't have the resources to do it. It only costs up to 10000 to actually get the answers that we need and to be able to, I mean, this is years in the making. So I support the superintendent's request to support the contract. So let me just be clear on what I was saying. It's not that I don't support the idea behind it. My concern is that within what we're asking Versatrans to do, there are some very sensitive concerns to the public and to the children and to the parents of those children that we're asking Versatrans to work within. Again, mm -hmm. elementary school, high school stu schools, uh, you know, being combined, kids riding together, um, changing the start times at other schools. Those are the things that are built into this Versatrans consideration and what they're asked to look at which we are endorsing by saying this is what we want you to do all right make it happen for us and then have the community come to us and say this is unacceptable we're not happy with that and that hasn't been properly vetted we've talked to it we've talked about it before but we haven't talked about it most recently as we move this contract forward and i'm saying if we spend the money and it comes back positive then we have we should be implementing it and at that point not saying you know what it would work but we definitely hear what the community says mm -hmm. maybe we aren't going to do it so I just want to make sure that this committee feels confident behind their vote that we believe that elementary school students and high school students are okay to ride together mm -hmm. and that changing the start time at the elementary school and at the middle school is okay because that's what we're asking verse trans to do mm -hmm. And if we go back on that afterwards, then it doesn't make any sense to spend the money to do this. But we're doing it based on information and knowledge at that point if we go back on that. It's, it's based on what we, what we know. I mean, so we're doing it. And as my daughter just entered middle school this year, so she was an elementary school student. And other than kindergarten, where you have to stand at the bus with the student, with the, the child, it's actually kind of scary to send your child to stand out there. And I would definitely welcome a high school students in the bus stop to be there and to know because we have wonderful statistics and we have AP um, successful AP programs I believe in our high school students and I, if they mess up they're not on the bus again so it's a one-shot deal kind of thing and and I don't think that that would stop it I think actually that might be a benefit because a lot of people don't really like their the cars going fast um, I mean I had to ask older kids that were like in fifth grade can you watch my first and second grader to make sure that you know whatever if you have high school students out there I've seen how nurturing they are to the young ones and I would just definitely welcome it but mostly I think that if we don't look at the whole picture and look at clearly what we're deciding on then we're just going to be dragging this out for another however many years the superintendent has looked at it and she says okay let's figure it out and it's what I would agree with the superintendent just because I don't want to drag this on. We will at least have the information and the knowledge being the power that we need to decide one way or another at that point. Now, um, Ms. Nykercheck was next, but I think the superintendent, if you would, in, uh, wanted to. I did, but. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. My I, comment, I'm sorry. You go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, my comment is brief anyway. I, I definitely support the contract. I think, as Ms. Duval points out, I think it's worth investigating the, the benefits. Um, I think the benefits outweigh the costs. In, in this case. Um, certainly the concern about the elementary and the middle school kids having to change their schedule is definitely something to think about. But I don't think that that should stop us from investigating the possibilities and finding out if it's even feasible. 
I just want to um, say that why I would like to get this done is because I would like to put this thing to bed with me. Um, I don't know the outcome. I think that Mr. Zakowski brings some very good points up. Uh, I'm not sure I'd want my elementary child out there that early either. These are the parameters. They've been given to us. I think we need to investigate them. And then I think the school committee needs to make a final decision on this. One way or another, it should end. Either you're going to do what comes out of that report, and I'm not even saying there won't be additional busing costs coming out of that report, along with different start times that people may not want in this community. That will probably happen. But then the school committee has investigated everything you can investigate. You've looked at it upside and downside. Make a decision, and whatever that decision is, leave it alone. We cannot keep spending five more years of the time of the administrators, the school committee members, and others in this district on this subject. I am telling you, there are other things that need to get done. So I'm just trying to move us off a dime. We need a final decision. This keeps erupting, and I keep getting emails, and I respond to all of them. All of the administrators do. Some of the emails are nice, some aren't. Um, and we don't have time for this. We need to figure out if this works or it doesn't, and then make a decision one way or another. Mm -hmm. Mr. Schell. Um, I, I respect what Mr. Zahowski, the points he raises. And my understanding of what VersaTrans is going to do for us is they're not going to give us uh, how you phrase it as a positive or a negative outcome. They're just going to say, this is the data you asked us to investigate and this is what we got. Um, and, that, and I'm going into the vote with, with that in mind. Um, there are two observations I want to make. One is, um, I, in talking to, to Versatrans, I, I asked them, you know, could, could we do this a different way? And they said, well, you could structure a contract where we're kind of working with you to put these things through, it would cost less, but it would take more time. So there's the time and the, and the value of money. Um, and the other thing that came to mind when I was talking to Versatrans was that if we had had, um, as I indicated earlier, kind of a more thorough training whenever we implemented Versatrans, let's say it was six years ago, uh, then we would be in a better position to do this ourselves so that we could not have to spend the money on it, you know, on an ad hoc basis. Then that's just a very narrow focus, but I felt I had to say it. I just have one issue and a concern, and the concern is back to what someone else had brought up, is that we're not following the directive, with it being an 845 that we're giving them when we, the directive was, um, the motion was between 8 and 830. So um, I'm just concerned about that. I just wanted to bring that point up. What, uh, Mark, could you tell me again, what was the start time? It was an 845. 835. It was still. 835? <laughs> but, oh, but that's, that's just fine. 835 is different than 845. <laughs> the time parameter that was given was between 8 and 830 mm -hmm. to have a start time at the high school. The plan after we met with Howard for the three hours was to start the elementary at 750. The high school was to start at 8 and the middle school was to start at 835. So it met the criteria, eight was the earliest of that range. So it is within the parameters of that. That is correct. Okay, thank you. That is correct. Okay. Okay, any other comments or questions about the, uh, about the essentially about this approval of the Tyler Technologies contract? Okay. So, um, why don't we um, have a vote on it? And I just, uh, suspect it might just be easier to call the roll. Uh, just to. Uh, okay. I support the contract. <laughs> yes or no? I do support it. Mr. Dan No. Mr. Terry Yes. Yes. No. Yes. No. Five, 
Agreed. Okay. So the motion carries and the contract is approved uh, by a vote of five to three. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank Can you. we just make sure that the time parameters are right? So that These are the time parameters that Howard wants. <laughs> the paper says 845. That's all. But we gave him what Howard gave us. I'm, okay. I'm sorry, I wasn't part of that meeting. But I just right. want to and make sure that it's it's no, within the 8 to 8.30. Yeah, it's 8 o'clock for the high school. It is 8 o'clock at the That's high school. what he just said. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Could it be possible? Yeah. Because the paper, don't, don't believe the paper we, says we, it. <laughs> that's Could it be possible that's to share the share Barbara, the where did you get your information? The school I mean, Mr. McLaughlin, would it be possible for you to share what what the... Howard? The so let's uh, paper relied on no with the school committee because I haven't seen any of those documents. It doesn't fall within the parameters. Um, Mark, uh, Mark, Mark, would you please call Howard in the morning and double check your notes and Joy's notes, which show those times? Okay. Both of you have the same times. Just call Howard one more time. Well, it's still out. It's outside of the window of what the but eight o'clock instructed the superintendent. We're now we're now moving into talk that's not on the agenda so we right. should no, I, just, I just want to mm -hmm. ask make a request of the superintendent and the business manager to have the information made available to the to the school committee generally sure. because I received the superintendent's memo on the start time change and the different scenarios but there was no information about the actual times for the hub plan I didn't yeah. have those I'm sorry right I guess it's just difficult yeah. to okay. make the decision about the information no problem okay. Okay, so now we'll uh, continue on in the agenda and actually we'll return uh, to an earlier part of the agenda, um, which is a vote um, to accept a gift from the NEF SOS Book Fund. Um, and I believe uh, Joe Bartolomeo is here this evening and uh, he will make the presentation of the um, SOS Book Fund. Good evening. Uh, I think this will be a lot simpler than the previous discussion. Uh, for those of you who are new to the, uh, the school committee, uh, the SOS Book Fund is designed to provide textbooks, library books, and their high-tech equivalents to each school. Uh, each school council makes a recommendation on how the fund should be spent, and with the approval of the NEF board, uh, those recommendations are funded. Uh, I also always like to mention the two principal uh, sources of funding for this. One will be arriving in your mailbox within the next month or so, the annual census appeal. Uh, the other is, has now become a kind of anticipated community event, the plant sale on the day before Mother's Day. Those are the two principal sources. And I'm happy to report that this year I have a check for eighteen thousand four hundred and fifty two dollars and so okay. thank you thank you make a motion to accept <laughs> before he changes his mind <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh, there's been a motion to accept this uh, generous gift is there a second Thanks. second second okay um, and just as a point of clarification you um, NEF has a formula that it uses in terms of how that's distributed. Yes, it's done on a per capita basis, and actually this year it will be seven dollars per student. Okay. Uh, so that the funds are distributed equally throughout the district. Yes. Okay. That's correct. Great. Okay. Okay. So all those in favor of accepting the check, say aye. 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 All those opposed. I don't hear anyone. Okay, <laughs> I believe it's unanimous. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you to very the, much. The NEF board. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you very much. Okay, the um, next item on the agenda, returning to the order, is the business manager's report. Uh, my report is shorter, much shorter than um, uh, it has been, but half of the notes that I have on here re revolved around the Versatrans and the Tyler technology, which I don't have to repeat. Um, financials uh, were also attached to this as sent to you um, as it was run out of the system. 
And the final note is if any of you have been in the schools uh, over the winter vacation, you're gonna, you would have noticed a number of hallways and stairwells and uh, classrooms being painted. We were working on some uh, building improvements uh, during that time period. Um, I just had one question, Mr. Um, sure. Mr. McLaughlin, Mr. McLaughlin um, Mr. Zahowski referred to the personnel reserve that we draw and when we hire new personnel during the year and there was uh, money set aside at the beginning of last fiscal year. I'm wondering what's the, stat what's the status of that account, what's the balance in that account that would be available for We have used some of board. that is in prior discussions. I don't have the exact number, but I can get that for you for the next meeting. That'd be great. Thanks. Okay, and um, then the next item is the personnel report, um, which I believe you also included in the um, in the packet uh, with all the new hires, separations, and promotions and transfers. So that's there. If anyone has any questions about the personnel report, okay. Um, then we turn to the superintendent's report. Mm -hmm. I have very um, brief items tonight. I have three. Uh, one I need to mention because I see um, Barbara in the audience, our early ed coordinator, um, and that is our kindergarten registration. This year it's being done a little bit differently. It's going to be the dates of February 26th, 27th, and March 1st. And all kindergarten registration is going to be done at JFK. Um, one includes the March 1st date, it's a Saturday. <clears throat> There'll be a program set up for um, the children, et cetera, during that. And uh, information has already been sent to um, all the children's parents we know who will be of kindergarten age for next year. So again, we're doing a little bit differently. All registrations at JFK, it's March 26th, 27th, and March 1st. Um, and the Saturday session will include live performance and other activities for children. Postcards have been mail mailed to all eligible resident children and their families. And you can look on our website for more information. Secondly, uh, I've been trying to arrange a, a workshop with um, um, the school committee and the superintendent. It's called Roles and Responsibilities of School Committee Members and Superintendents. It's a working session. Uh, I tried arranging that for next week. And uh, the item I'm going to tell you next is one of the reasons I had to cancel it. But uh, I will be sending another email out to everyone. We're now looking to do this in March. And um, the reason is that next Monday night there is uh, a meeting of um, Representative Colcott and Senator Rosenberg. They're going to be at the JFK school right here um, Monday, uh, January 13th from 7 to 8. And they're looking to discuss the idea of increased state revenue, progressive tax reform, uh, and provide critical support uh, with that tax reform for public schools and other basic services. So I would encourage as many school committee members uh, who can make that meeting to please do so. Uh, I also plan to attend. Um, and those were the three items I had this evening. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, next item on the agenda is an update on the superintendent search. Um, and I wanted to um, um, make uh, one, uh, well, one update regarding the um, superintendent uh, screening committee. I've received inquiries um, and emails already from people that uh, would like to uh, serve on that committee. Um, we. I'm, what I'm going to do is uh, ask the public, and we'll put some information out, um, hopefully in the newspaper as well as on our uh, website. Um, again, we're looking to put together a screening committee of approximately uh, 9 to 11 um, individuals. That's been the number that we've used in the past. Um, we're going to be using, again, the same structure of having a representative from the central office, having at least one of the principals represented, um, having um, a representative from uh, uh, the, the, uh, the association <coughs> represented, an elementary school parent, a middle school parent, a high school parent, um, and then some community members, as well as obviously a, a liaison from our committee. So um, we are going to be looking for community members slash parents of those different levels, 
And I would ask that if parents are interested in serving on the committee, um, that they email a letter of interest uh, to the mayor's office, um, mayor at northamptonma.gov. Um, and I would ask uh, folks uh, get those into me by January 31st. Um, the goal under the timeline that DESDEC put together for us is that I would um, confer uh, with um, the vice chair on this and that we would uh, I would be able to announce the appointments to that screening committee at our February 13th meeting um, so we would appoint the screening committee at the February 13th meeting um, and then they would be able to then follow through on the schedule that we've put together um, uh, there's also uh, it just updates that the you know, the postings have gone out. Uh, they've all been posted. NESDEC has, uh, has posted the actual superintendent search um, and, uh, and basically you know, indicated that the screening process will commence on February 14th. Um, and so we expect that uh, now that that's public, that NESDEC will begin receiving applications for prospective candidates. Um, I don't know if there are any other components to the search committee that we can update on at this point? No, just that indeed we have checked and the um, publicity is out there. Okay. Um, and I talked with um, um, the executive director last week and he assured me that um, he expected that there would be candidates. So okay. I'm very hopeful. Okay. I would just, in regards to the screening committee and um, what the commitment is, it's a rather um, lengthy uh, commitment um, over a short period of time so there will be a few uh, evenings <coughs> uh, workshops where we will have NESDEC come in um, the first one is usually between two and three hours the second one's a little shorter um, just going through some training as to um, what the procedure and development of questions will be um, to set the interview schedule um, and then to get a distribution of the applicants uh, packet so that we can begin to look at them and then come together as a group and then make some decisions as to who would we want to bring forward as finalists. But um, it will be quite a bit of work in a very short period of time. Um, and it's something that we'll be looking to do in mid um, to late February so that we can really start setting up those finalist interviews in the early part of March. Okay. Any questions about that process? So it would be great if folks could um, send information out to their email lists or their uh, uh, other sources that they have in your own wards um, just to solicit volunteers who may want to serve on the screening committee and, and we'll try to get um, get as many candidates as we can and we'll try to do our best to, to put together a good committee and get the process going. So that's my update on that. Um, I don't believe we have any new business items uh, scheduled for this evening. Um, future business and meeting dates, uh, the, um, actually it says to be determined here but we have actually scheduled it. The, um, the, f the budget uh, finance uh, kickoff meeting that I have called um, which is a joint meeting of the school committee and the city council um, will happen on uh, January 31st. Um, uh, 30, 30th, 30th, excuse me, 30th. I've got 31st. Um, and it'll be here at the JFK uh, Middle School. Um, I believe we posted it at 7 o'clock. So, um, uh, so 7 o'clock here. Uh, that, that'll be the next meeting. And then, of course, your next regular meeting will be on February 13th at 7.15 p.m. Um, so those are the next couple of meetings that are on our schedule. I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Okay. okay. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>